All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Creech. I am your moderator for this evening's presentation as part of the National Fellows Online Education Subcommittee. Um, tonight, we're going to learn about dietary supplements, what sports medicine physicians need to know from Dr. Melissa Gibbons. Before we get started, um, this tonight's presentation and every presentation as part of the National Fellows Online Lecture Series is brought to you by the AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee, the Education Committee, as well as the Fellowship Committee. Some basic goals are just to help supplement your current sports medicine education and any education provided by your fellowship program, help introduce you to some really great national speakers, as well as help prepare you for your CAQ board exam. We ask that throughout tonight's presentation that you mute your microphone and turn off your video. We do encourage questions, so should you have any throughout tonight's lecture, please feel free to submit them in the chat, and then I'll gather them all and have a question and answer period at the end of tonight's presentation. So now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Colonel Retired Melissa Gibbons. She received her Bachelor's of Science from the United States Military Academy, her MD from the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences, and her Master's of Public Health from the University of Texas. She is board certified in emergency medicine with subspecialty training in clinical toxicology as well as sports medicine. Additionally, she holds her, um, her strength and conditioning uh, specialist certification. Throughout her over 25 year history with the United States Army, she served in various academics and operational assignments. She has done several uh, combat tours as well as deployments, working with both conventional as well as special operation forces. In her current position, she is the director of the Consortium for Health and Military Performance at the Uniform Services University. She is the proud mother of three girls and one dog, um, and has a passion for weightlifting as well as the outdoors. So without further ado, I will turn the screen on over uh, to Dr. Gibbons. Thanks so much. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to speak and just kind of to talk about a subject I really enjoy talking about. Um, I kind of got interested in the dietary supplement arena long before I became a physician. I mean, as you heard in my bio, um, I was a competitive weightlifter in college. And that was kind of when I was first introduced to the supplement world, because obviously the weightlifting community is always trying to figure um, out how to how to engage and, and take things that might enhance performance. And so I really kind of got interested in it long before um, my medical career. Um, but then obviously as, as then I went into toxicology and ended up consulting on several cases that folks had bad outcomes um, from supplements, then I was like, huh, maybe we need to know a little bit more about this. And then I had the benefit of being connected with, with CHAMP, the Consortium for Health and Military Performance early in my career. And CHAMP actually led the way for the Department of Defense in standing up something called Operation Supplement Safety, um, which is actually an educational resource for the Department of Defense on supplements. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but I really kind of want to share with everybody just an approach to dietary supplements and then give you, you know, a couple of pearls for boards. Um, but kind of what I really want to provide is I'm going to do some storytelling because I find when you interact with patients who want to take supplements, you know, they kind of hear the blah, 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 blah of the rules and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes having some anecdotes to share with them um, can really make it easier to inform them when they're considering taking various supplements. So I'll, I'll try and share some of that with you. So this is a little bit of a mix of a presentation. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And of course, it doesn't want to see my slides, so give me a minute here. Let's try it again. There it is. Okay, can somebody give me a thumbs up that you can see slides okay? Or yes, thanks, Julie. 
Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, yes. Give you that little background. Of course, I have to do the government disclosures. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest, and I am speaking on behalf of myself and not the official position of Uniformed Services University or the Department of Defense. So we already talked about what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, learn a bit just about the regulation of dietary supplements. We'll understand kind of the labels and helping our patients um, and athletes read them. Um, and then just kind of talk about some concerns and issues that you need to know about. And if we have time at the end, um, we can do a little bit of, of, you know, prep for the, for the boards. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have for me. Um, I always, I always get weary with dietary supplement questions because there are hundreds hundreds of thousands of products out there. So I might not know the answer about each individual product, but I can hopefully point you in the right direction. So why are we even talking about this? Um, I am not gonna read through every single one of these data points, but at the end of the day, about two thirds of athletes um, are taking dietary supplements or are considering taking dietary supplements. I mean, it's, it is prevalent in the athlete community. Obviously, there are some products that are more common than others, but depending on people's um, beliefs and desires and goals, um, you can really see a mix of everything. And I think, you know, COVID really added a layer to that. Um, you know, I have really noticed an uptake in people asking a lot of questions about various things in relation to immune health and brain health on top of performance. And so um, I think, you know, this is just part and parcel of our practice now and being able to speak towards it um, is, is just really not even just as a sports medicine physician, but just as a physician in general, being able to talk about this industry and be confident in what you're talking about is really important. Um, if you're not aware um, the dietary supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and the growth projections are insane for what um, the market growth is anticipated to be. So it's, it's just going to get more and more, um, you know, so, so as I laid out here, there's obviously in the athlete community, the things you see more commonly with, you know, protein products being by and large the most common. And that's kind of a relief because it's, you know, it's pretty easy to talk about those um, and then, then we get into, you know, the various performance enhancers. Um, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of times for, especially for our high school and college age students, it's not even just the athlete stuff. It's like, what are, what are college age students drinking, you know, energy drinks. And so, so sometimes it's a mix of the, both the age demographics and then the athlete community. So just being aware of that. All right, so we have to start this with understanding what a dietary supplement is um, a lot of a lot of products are out there that will claim to be a dietary supplement, but they actually don't meet the criteria. And that becomes important when we look at like regulation and then how um, they are actually monitored from a safety standpoint. So in terms of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which really kind of lays all this out, um, a dietary ingredient, which is what can be in a dietary supplement is either a vitamin, a mineral, an herb or botanical, an amino acid, a dietary substance, or some part or piece thereof. It, and actually it is intended to be taken by mouth. Um, it's excluded if it's not taken by mouth. And so that's, that's kind of an important criteria when it comes to regulation. So, uh, you know, everybody has, you know, a lot of things that they say about dietary supplements and it, it sometimes is really easy to kind of tell your patients, oh, you shouldn't take supplements because they're not regulated. Um, that's, that's kind of a partial truth. It's not really fully true and I'll go through why. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people say, well, the FDA doesn't, you know, have any oversight on supplements. That's, that's not true either. Um, what is true is supplements are not really approved before they go to market. It's only after they're on the market, if there is something that's found to be unsafe, that then the FDA gets involved. Um, so the manufacturer bears that responsibility, but unfortunately there's no pre-market testing like there is for an approved drug. Um, and then if it's on the market and it's been shown 
to be say unsafe or misbranded, then the FDA can take action um, to either put out a, you know, a notice about it or, you know, letters to the to the manufacturer to to no longer manufacture it or correct the problem or, you know, there's several actions that they can take. So I think, you know, it helps to kind of understand the difference of the various labels so you know what you're kind of looking at. So for food products, um, so food products will have nutrition facts, um, drugs to include over-the-counter drugs will have drug facts, and then supplements um, will have a supplement um, fact in terms of their ingredients. It's pretty similar what's on there. I mean, obviously, you know, the content broken down. Um, and then some sort of um, dosage type type declaration to go along with it. Um, but there are some minor differences among the labeling that you should be aware of. And it, you know, it helps your patient kind of be able to identify what they're taking. So, you know, the thing that I think is the take home to this is for foods, they have to be generally recognized as safe, which means I, you know, I can eat this all day long and it's not going to hurt me. Um, I might gain some weight, but it's not going to hurt me. For meds, even over-the-counter meds, they have to have data before they go to market. And then for dietary supplements, it's only after market if there's a problem that it goes. So that's the difference in who gets to have each one of those labels. So, and I kind of alluded to this earlier. So what is not a dietary supplement? And this, this creates kind of a regulatory um, gray zone um, because there are a lot of products out there that are not in oral form. And so they kind of fall into maybe into cosmetics or, or just in a, in a non-regulated zone. Um, and so it's concerning because there are a lot of products that would be um, appealing to athletes. So things that are, you know, of the various patches, injectables, creams, those kind of things. Um, and so some of them that you will typically see, so your peptides, um, peptides pretty common in the athlete community. They really, up until about a year and a half ago, if there was a peptide being sold orally, um, it doesn't work. Like, like I was really happy. I could say that to people of like, if you're going online and you're buying a peptide and it is a oral peptide, it, it doesn't work because the technology did not exist to make those bioavailable, um, other than, than parenteral. Um, but actually the technology was developed about a year and a half ago where they did some linking of the peptides to make them be able to do what they needed to do in our GI tract to be functioning. Um, so you can't even say that to patients anymore, but by and large, um, if they are, you know, if they're looking for a, for, a, for an oral peptide, it probably is a substance that doesn't work and is very likely to be contaminated. Um, the weight loss products, there's a lot of them that are, you know, injectables out there. Vitamin B12 is very common in the athlete community. Um, and so, you know, those are actually technically not dietary supplements. And so um, then you have to be concerned, how are they being, you know, purchased? What is the um, manufacturer and distributor um, actually declaring? And then what sort of regulation has, you know, is there surrounding them? So they, they're a little bit riskier um, category of things because they don't really fall clearly in a category. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, what the FDA can do, um, they can come in and, and uh, remove products or send out warning letters. On the left is just some, you know, some ones that the FDA has taken action on that were pretty, um, you know, uh, abundant in the dietary supplement community. Um, and, you know, so, and, and I'll just use a, an example, DMHA is, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, along the lines, it was originally like a nasal spray, but it's supposed to be a cognitive enhancer and it has some stimulant effects. I think a lot of people are familiar with DMAA. DMAA was banned in the military because it, it was connected to a couple deaths in the military. Um, and so it was taken off the shelves. So um, all of these have had, you know, actions where it was shown, yeah, they either could do harm. Um, a couple of them are actually drugs, not in the U.S., but drugs from other countries. And that's another 
thing that the FDA will occasionally take action on is that if it was never really a dietary supplement, it was just a drug from somewhere else that was introduced to the market, they will often ban it as a dietary supplement. So what do you need to know about dietary supplements in sport? There's a couple of places you can kind of go to that are, that are athlete resources. Um, so, um, access is actually, it requires a login. So that's, that's kind of the only downside, um, to access is you have to like sign up for it, but this is what like the NCAA uses, PGA uses it, a couple other, a couple other, um, uh, sport authorities use it. And so access, you can go in, you can look up, um, you know, look up the supplement and see what you want to do. But like I said, it, it does require registration. So that might slow people down. Um, WADA maintains a prohibited list. And, um, and if you're not aware, WADA has all these categories that I have listed there on the left-hand side. And so, you know, anything that falls into um, those categories are either, you know, depending on the category banned or, you know, have limitations to when they can be taken in relation to competition. So um, it's good to kind of, you know, go to the WADA website, refresh yourself on their various um, categories so you can, you know, so you can counsel your athletes as well. So in the DOD, we actually also maintain a um, prohibited list and our prohibited list um, is now we have our, over 4,000 unique ingredients, but we took everything off um, the WADA list, off the FDA advisory list, and kind of consolidated everything, and then also looked at it from a military perspective mm -hmm. and put it into the DOD prohibited list. And we are in the process of of developing an app, which hopefully should be released in this upcoming year, where you can. Um, take your supplement and look for the ingredient and see if it is prohibited. And, and if it's prohibited in the DOD, there's a good chance it's prohibited in sport as well. So it might be a, a shortcut in the future, as opposed to, you know, going to these various websites and doing that. So just a little teaser of hangout, hopefully that'll, that'll come out soon. Um, and, I, and I'll talk about some other tools that we have on our operations supplement safety website, kind of as we advance a little bit. So in terms of dietary supplement reporting and adverse events, um, this is the FDA portal for reporting adverse events. And I will tell you um, that it's so underreported for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's really hard to narrow down are the symptoms somebody is having from a dietary supplement truly due to that supplement or to something else? Because it can sometimes be vague symptoms. But this is not a user friendly system. Um, you have to like log in and do all these kind of things. And so, um, you know, just recognize that our knowledge about dietary supplements is definitely limited. Um, because it's hard to get, you know, this data on the adverse outcomes. And so, you know, assuming, oh, it's on the market and everybody's using it is, is not a great assumption because the, the reporting criteria are just not there. And remember, they didn't have to pass any, you know, safety standards to get things to market. So what happens is, um, you know, the FDA is reliant on this reporting to be able to know, hey, are bad things happening and then go investigate it. Um, and, and it's just a very limited process. So, you know, so just understand this is just a high risk industry. So the other, you know, the other entity that's involved in this is the FTC. FTC. Um, so if you've ever picked up a supplement bottle and all of an example of a couple of men, you know, sometimes they just say some incredulous things on there. Um, and so the FTC will get involved if um, the labels are, you know, claiming to do something that is, you know, false or unsubstantiated. This is, was super common in COVID. You know, there's so many supplements that hit the market that it's like, you know, we'll cure or prevent COVID. And, and there's just no way they can keep up with all of that. Um, you know, so just kind of helping your your athletes be aware of like, if it has these ridiculous claims, it's probably not the most credible supplement company out there. So they might want to double think that. And that, that actually goes into one of the criteria we'll kind of go through on how, how your athletes can look at their um, dietary supplement. All right. So let's just kind of talk about some, you know, some issues and concerns. So, you know, obviously we talked about, you know, the FDA has limited resources, 
you know, the internet's a mess. Um, I mean, you know, it is just, it's so predatory in terms of dietary supplements. And so I think it, you know, I mean, even as a physician who's educated in this, it is so hard for me to wade through that information and not be influenced by, you know, all of this propaganda that's, that's really targeted at your weak spots. Um, and so just understanding that, you know, that our youth and our athletes are very vulnerable to this, um, and helping them be a little bit more conscious of how that predatory marketing can affect them. Um, you know, we'll talk about high risk supplements, you know, the, these are the ones that are, you know, weight loss supplements, anything that's, you know, designed for performance enhancement or growth tends to be high risk. Um, you know, things that, uh, that are, you know, in that predatory marketing category, um, Contaminants and adulterants are super common. And I'm going to, I'm going to walk through, we do a lot of content testing, um, at champ. So when we kind of hear from the folks that interface with us, um, about supplements that are popular, we try and content test them, um, because we're looking for, you know, Hey, are there things in there that might be, um, you know, risky to our patient population? And, and you'll be surprised at some of the things we find. Um, and then just understand that, you know, these supplements have a, you know, they really do have a potential for adverse events, but it's, it's very poorly documented. So when we talk about high risk stuff, um, you know, this is, this is what we use in the department of defense. I mean, obviously within the athlete community, you, you could add some, some things in depending on what the sport is, you know, so if, so you've got a sport that has, um, you know, certain environmental conditions or, um, you know, just certain behaviors, you know, you might need to think about different things in terms of what's high risk. Um, but in terms of the, how we kind of chose what was high risk for us are, these are the ones that are very commonly predatory marketed. Um, they're, you know, in terms of their, they have a high amount of, um, uh, contaminants, adulterants, or, um, they just don't have at all in them, you know, what they say they do. So, so these are the ones that, that kind of worry us in terms of categories. So we'll talk about anabolic or anabolic like substances. Um, you know, I mean, you can see just, you know, by, by some of the names that are out there, I love, you know, kind of looking at supplement names because some of them are pretty clever and, and entertaining, um, you know, but anything that's targeting, you know, growth or strength or, um, you know, uh, anything along those lines that is influencing, you know, your HPA access and your testosterone um, all fall into this category. We see a lot of these, you know, we get a lot, a lot of questions, um, about these. And so, you know, we've interfaced with several of these companies many times. So SARMs, um, you know, are super common in our population, not, you know, in the athlete population, not at, you know, the competitive level where they're being tested, but this is SARMs are prevalent in the high schoolers. We actually have a lot of, you know, folks in the military that were introduced to this as athletes um, in high school. So, so you have to worry about SARMs. SARMs is really interesting because there's some data on SARMs, you know, because these, you know, are androgen receptor modulators and they are tissue selective in the studies that are out there, they do show muscle growth in like geriatrics and sarcopenia due to HIV and those kind of things. So there is some data out there to suggest that the problem is, is, is in a, you know, we just don't have any long-term data on it and we don't have any risk data. Um, but there, there is some data to suggest there is an increased risk of, um, of MI and, um, CVAs. And so, um, and then depending on the product, um, elevated liver enzymes, there was mixed results on like lipid profiles, depending on the specific SARM. Um, but it, it really is kind of a mixed bag and it's kind of hard to sort this one out, but at the end of the day, SARMs are actually not dietary supplements. They are, they're considered a, a chemical intermediary, um, and they're not declared as a drug yet. And they're, they're not a dietary supplement. So they're kind of an interesting product. Um, aromatase inhibitors, obviously these are, you know, for the most part, they're drugs, but then there are supplements introduced on the market, um, that try and get around the drug labeling and anything that's, you know, trying to increase the testosterone, 
um, by blocking the conversion to estradiol is going to fall into the AI. And so, you know, there are approved pharmaceuticals out there, but then there are all these chemical derivations of aromatase inhibitors that are pretty popular in the athlete community as well. Um, so we'll just kind of, you know, here's an example of, you know, of a product we picked up and tested. So if you look at the label on this, you know, so first of all, I read the label um, and it's Reaper DNA resurrection. Like, what are they trying to sell here? You know, like it's, it's really fascinating to me. Um, you know, if, if I was, you know, 19 years old looking at, you know, the shelf of, of some, you know, supplement store, um, and I'm going to choose DNA resurrection. Like what, a, what am I even looking for? So of course, then when you look at the label, it's got a SARM there. Um, arimastane is a, is a, um, aromatase inhibitor. Epiandrosterone is a, you know, steroid analog. And then, oh good. I've got my reserve at all. I got my glass of red wine. So that's going to make it all okay. Um, and then I've got my knack in there, you know, I'm going to protect my liver. Um, you know, so, so as we start throwing all this stuff together, we don't, we have no idea how any of this stuff works when you combine it. So I just find these labels absolutely fascinating, um, to, to read. So, uh, you know, a lot of concerning, um, ingredients there. So when we tested this, um, this is what showed up on um, the GC map spec in terms of what was actually in it. And we can go through these, what they, you know, what they all are. So, you know, bunch of anabolic steroids in there that were not declared on the label. And here's my concern. And this is, you know, this is what I, I tend to tell people is the, you know, obviously these supplement companies want people to keep buying their supplements. So they, they actually, you know, they, they might want these guys to see gains. And if they're gains from oral anabolics, you know, that risk from oral anabolics um, for liver toxicity is much higher than actually just, you know, injecting um, whichever testosterone preparation you get. So I, you know, I mean, if I was going to choose between, Hey, let's take this dietary supplement that has all these, you know, knockoff you know, steroid analogs, or I'm actually just going to inject testosterone, you know, like that's actually the safer bet, you know, I'd prefer they didn't do any of that, but you know, you kind of, you know, I mean, there, some of these people are just bound and determined to do something. And it's like trying to talk them through while well, you're choosing the least safe alternative. And then when you look at, okay, this company is so dishonest that they're just throwing whatever chemical, you know, steroid they have in their lab into the bottle, um, you know, clearly they don't care about your health or wellness. So, so I think being armed with like, you know, some of these analysis results has really helped me have good conversations, um, with my, you know, with my service members and athletes and patients. And so, you know, just, just looking at this list. And then as you can see, um, you know, in addition to the steroids, there's aromatase inhibitor in there, um, you know, the SARMs in there. Uh, Adrafinil is a, is actually a pro, a precursor to modafinil, um, you know, the drug modafinil. So, um, again, like, like, why is that in there? Um, so really interesting results in this one. Um, and this is just kind of looking at, um, you know, what's, what's being sold out there. Um, so Osterin is a SARM, um, and obviously, you know, it, this is what's on the label, <laughs> And, and they're basically just getting around these regulations by saying this is not for human consumption, but yet I put it in a bottle and I say it's for physique enhancing agent, you know, so it's, it's just horrible predatory marketing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. here they have not for human consumption, a research chemical, but clearly I put it in a capsule and I gave you suggested use. So um, really, really, you know, awful ways of getting at this. Um, so pre-workout, super common, um, you know, and, and some people just, just love them. Um, you know, if I, I always try and advise, there's people that are going to use pre-workout no matter what. So I always try and guide them to kind of have the fewest ingredients as possible because it gets really messy once, you know, they have more than three or four ingredients in there. At least when it's just a few ingredients, you can look at the dosage and kind of figure out what those interactions will be. Um, you know, typically they'll have, you know, caffeine, 
something that acts on the nitric oxide system is pretty common because that's what gives them, you know, the tinglys and kind of that flush feeling and, and the pump. There's no data that it does anything. Um, but, but people like that, um, you know, that feedback they get that they think something's working, um, you know, and then there's, there's usually kind of a mix of other, other stimulants in there, but, you know, we see a, a lot of pre-workouts. Um, here you can see, you know, they just, they throw a lot of stimulants together, um, you know, and then, you know, creatine, creatine's really gained um, a lot in terms of evidence. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when everybody was like, oh, creatine's horrible, it's going to kill your kidneys. And then the data came out to say, no, it, it really doesn't. Um, and, you know, creatine's showing some pretty neat stuff in terms of preventing sarcopenia in the elderly. And there's some actually... Um, uh, some data coming out of preventing um, cognitive decline in the elephant. So, so creatine is kind of interesting, but there's really no need to take a bunch of different formulations of creatine and throw it together like it is in this package. And then, you know, when you look at the stimulants, um, theocrine is, is a caffeine derivative. So, you know, we're just throwing a lot of creatine at somebody. Um, herp huperzine, um, actually has a little bit of data in, in Alzheimer's, but it, it has, it's like reported side effects with, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So, you know, I don't know if I'd want to be taking a bunch of huperzine before I start my workout, because you might have some significant GI distress. Um, weight loss products kind of along the same theme as pre-workouts tends to be filled with a whole bunch of stimulants and then, you know, various things that are, you know, associated with appetite suppression. Um, you know, they just tend to be very dirty concoctions. Um, one of the things that we used to say in, in toxicology is, is, uh, when you get, when you have somebody overdose and they take more than five different substances, it's really hard for them to kill themselves because they're not getting an effective dose of anything. And that same thing, you know, would apply in supplements, you know, like the more you're throwing together, they're probably counteracting each other or competing for the receptors or being, are revving up your P450 system and, you know, either increasing or decreasing metabolism. So who knows what happening when you throw all that together. Um, and I think the weight loss products um, tend to have kind of these, you know, crazy concoctions. So you can see here kind of some concerning things on this label, you know, when you look at the thiamine, you know, who needs 12,000% of their RDA of um, vitamin B1? You know, I mean, obviously it's water soluble vitamins, so they're gonna pee it out. But, you know, if you're seeing something like this on a label, um, you know, you can point this out and say, hey, this, this probably isn't the best idea for you. Um, and then, you know, like, again, there's just, you know, kind of this um, witch's brew of various things. We talk about proprietary blends. Um, you know, that's, that's something on a label that's concerning because a proprietary blend means I'm just not going to tell you um, what I use. So it, 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 in, it discloses a milligram amount here, but it doesn't tell you how much of each one of those individual substances. Um, so, you know, it's hard to know what, what an effective dose is or how those, you know, um, all added up to be 510 milligrams. Like, so it, again, it's kind of one of these labeling workarounds. Um, and I try and tell people to avoid any supplements that have proprietary blends. Energy drinks, um, you know, I mean, these are, these are everywhere, um, you know, and, and it, it's, it's hard to kind of talk about this because, you know, I mean, it, it's like, do we throw coffee into this, um, into this mix to talk about it? And, you know, so, so I find this one kind of hard to talk about. Um, so what I do is I try and focus on, okay, what are, you know, what are all the other things in energy drinks? And this tends to be what's in most of them. Um, you know, various governing agencies have come out um, and said certain things are, you know, are banned. Um, so depending on the agency, some of the some of the ingredients and in energy drinks are banned. So, you know, de depending on on, you know, what your athlete is participating in, you actually need to look that up and warn them about it. Um, some of them are just, uh, I know like the, uh, NCAA for some of them just says it's not a 
advised ingredient, which means that the school can't provide it for the athlete um, if it has that ingredient. It's not necessarily banned. It's just that the school can't provide it. And there's several ingredients and energy drinks that kind of fall into that as well. Um, but some of the concerns with energy drinks is that, you know, if this is, if this is all they consume, um, then they might, you know, be, be, you know, cutting short some of their other, you know, nutritional needs because they're not, you know, in taking what they need, um, can really screw up their sleep hygiene, you know, do the caffeine intake in it. Um, there are case reports out there of multiple adverse events, you know, related to this big sympathetic input. Um, and so it, you know, that's of concern, especially if they're, you know, consuming large volumes on a regular basis. So there are some studies and it was actually in video gamers. So it's like, you know, I, I always kind of wonder, you know, with sports medicine, are we, are we including now video gamers into our patient population? Um, because they're looking for these same like performance enhancements, you know, that are, that are more physical sports are. And, and, um, so the studies that showed the morphologic changes in, um, cardiac muscle were actually in gamers that were consuming large amounts of energy drinks. Um, there, same thing for, and this was in gamers as well, um, definitely documented increased risk of behavioral health concerns to include suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts from, you know, uh, large consumption of energy drinks. So I, I don't know why, so this is one of the graphics that, um, you know, the ops team develop and I find it really helpful um, you know, when I'm talking to folks about, Hey, what are, you know, what are you consuming? And so you can see the energy drinks down there at the bottom, you know, it, it to get your 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is, you know, the, the dose that is, you know, like safe dose, you know, can give you some performance enhancement, but not taking you over the top. And then to kind of give them some equivalence of that. All right, so that just kind of gave you, like I said, a little bit of you know storytelling, so you can help your athletes and your patients out. Um, I talked to you a little bit about ops. Um, it, you know, it it is it was designed for the DoD, but I use it a lot to answer layperson questions because all the information um, on ops is actually targeted at the layperson. So if I need um, you know, to, for them to read something, I will often go here and search it. So I wanted to share it with you. Um, it's not, it's not just for, you know, military members, it's for public use and it doesn't require a login or anything like that. Um, so it's going to familiarize you with the site. Um, I talked about the prohibited list and that, and the app on the way, um, I'm going to talk about the scorecard in a second. We have a ask, ask the expert feature, um, you know, so folks do have a specific question about a supplement, um, you know, it goes straight to our team and, and like sometimes I'll field some of those questions or some of our other team members will, um, but we use those to ask the experts to actually kind of see what's popular out there and it informs our content testing. And then, you know, we try and publish articles on, on, um, you know, just various things that are kind of hot topics, you know, so we recently did one, like I said, on immune health, because that seemed to be what everybody wanted to know about with COVID. Um, so there are some pretty useful resources there. Um, I've talked about, um, you know, the prohibited list. And so the FDA has an advisory list, the, um, you know, WADA has their prohibited list, and then NCAA has their list as well. Um, and then there are other, you know, random ones out there that you can go to. So, so it's kind of frustrating. It's all not consolidated or consistent, um, you know, but, but believe it or not, all these agencies talk to each other. We actually talk on a pretty regular basis. So there is a lot of cross-referencing from them. And as you can see, as I put up here on the ops website, we actually hyperlink out um, to the FDA as well to make it easy um, for you to kind of cross-reference stuff. So this is the scorecard that, um, you know, you might find it useful when you're having conversations, um, you know, with your athletes, if, if they're thinking um, of a dietary supplement um, and, you know, they're not in a sport that is regulated. So they have kind of the freedom of choice and can't, you know, can't go to a prohibited list. 
um, we found this useful to be able to, to guide folks. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through some examples of that, you know, third-party certification. I already talked about multiple ingredients, proprietary blends. Um, believe it or not, we try and say, hey, is it easy to pronounce the name of the ingredients, you know, because some of these, you know, chemical structure names and crazy plant stuff, um, you know, you it should be easy to pronounce it. And then we talked about labeling claims, you know, if there, if there's ridiculous claims on the label, they're, they're not in the spirit of dietary supplement regulation. So kind of puts it at increased risk to be, um, not a, you know, quality product. Um, and then we talked about percent daily values, you know, if, if they're more than, you know, a couple hundred percent of your, um, daily value, that's, that's probably not the most reputable thing either. Um, you know, the only one that I know, you know, like where it typically like vitamin C, that's a big one where, where folks are doing high dose vitamin C and way over what, um, you know, what the percent daily value is. Get a lot of questions on third-party certification. So the ones that we typically refer to are, are the seals, um, that you can see below. So NSF for sport. Um, some interesting stuff for NSF support um, for sport, um, CBD has raised a lot of controversy. So I think you have to know, um, you know, understand with the particular athlete that you're dealing with and what they are participating in, whether or not CBD is allowable or not, because NSF for sport has now rolled CBD in um, products to be, to meet their labeling criteria. So, um, just something, something you should know about. So the other ones all have different criteria. Um, but, but these tend to be a good place to start, um, where people get messed up is you'll often see these seals, these GMP seals. These are not safe for sports seals. Um, these only relate to the manufacturing process, not to what the actual, ingredients are. Um, and so, you know, I always try and keep a couple examples either in my office and stuff so that I can show people of like, okay, even though this looks like a label, um, it's not the label you're looking for. And that, that can kind of, um, catch people up sometimes. So when you're telling them what to look for, it can be helpful. We talked about this, you know, lots of ingredients, um, you know, and, and this one is obviously doesn't apply in all things. Cause if I pick up a multivitamin, um, bottle, clearly it's going to have a whole bunch of ingredients. And so it really kind of depends on the, on the product you're looking for. Um, but it, you know, it should lay them all out and it should put dosages, uh, um, your percent daily value with them. We talked about proprietary ingredients. Um, you know, the big, the big, um, category is often stimulants, you know, so a lot of these, um, even if they're within their threshold ranges, when you add them all up together, can, can really, um, create issues. And that's where you'll see, you know, like your tachycardias or your tremors, which can affect performance and those kind of things. And sometimes, you know, they're just not aware of like, Hey, you're not, you're not actually improving your performance with this. You're probably impairing it because you you've gone so far over what a, um, performance enhancing dosage threshold is. Um, so just being aware of that. Just examples of another proprietary blend. Um, you know, I don't know what 6,925 milligrams of what means in this preparation. Examples of just crazy claims, um, you know, I'm going to lose weight without diet or exercise, you know, I, I guess I'm going to cut my left arm off with the supplement bottle or something, but you know, there's, there's, uh, there's some fun stuff out there. So we'll just go through, I'll just go through a quick practical application. I have a few of these, but we'll just kind of walk through them. So this is just a multivitamin, you know, like, um, and, and now it's multivitamin for him doesn't have iron, you know, so the other one has iron. So you're kind of reading this, looking at it. Um, does anybody see the label on there? Um, it's third party certified. So we'll kind of go through the questions. Um, so do you see the third party certification? It's got the USP label up on, um, which will be the far left of your screen there. Um, so they get a thing for that. Are there less than six ingredients? Well, it's a multivitamin. So I'll have to like, kind of think about whether or not I'm gonna factor that in. Um, is it free of proprietary blend matrix or complex? Yep. Can you pronounce the names? I can pronounce most of those. Um, 
if it has caffeine, um, you know, is it 200 milligrams or less? Um, it doesn't have caffeine. So we're going to give it a point. Um, is the label free of questionable complaint, um, claims? Yeah. I mean, it says nutrients to support men's health. That's, that's pretty reasonable. And then you look at the, um, percent daily values, there are some over 200%. Um, and so, you know, what's the value of that depending on what the needs are. A lot of these are, are way over. And so, you know, then I kind of, I as a toxicologist then take a look and make sure that they're all water soluble, that patients aren't getting things um, that they don't need. So the one, um, you know, that's above that is vitamin D. Um, and we'll kind of talk about vitamin D. That's one of those tough ones. You know, I mean, a thousand IU is, is, you know, probably reasonable. Um, but like vitamin E isn't, is, you know, is another that, uh, is fat soluble. And so do I really want, you know, extra of vitamin E if the patient is not deficient? So, you know, this, even though this looks like, you know, Hey, it's just a simple multivitamin there, there are some concerns here. So, you know, you kind of have to look at it. Um, just kind of for sake of sake of time, I'm going to, I'm going to go quickly through these. We're not going to do all the scoring, but these are some of the questions we get, you know, like, you know, this is, this is, we got this in our asset export. Um, so there's these male enhancement pills, um, you know, and one of the ingredients was pregnant alone and they just wanted to know, Hey, well, will, will I pop positive and a steroid, you know, in a steroid test. So, you know, we looked up the product and, and this is kind of what's in it. Um, so it's got DHEA, it's got pregnenolone, um, got a whole bunch of other stuff in that, in there. Um, so, you know, when we go through the scores on this one, it gets a two, you know, it's horribly scoring. So it's like, yeah, you probably shouldn't take this anyway, but let's try and answer your question. Um, and so, you know, shortly after we had gotten a question on this one, you know, the FDA came out and said that it found that these extends, um, you know, just had Viagra in them. Um, you know, so, so it's like half that stuff in the label wasn't even really in there. It was just, it was just laced with Viagra. So, um, not exactly what I would want my folks taking without a prescription. Um, here's one that was shredded AF, um, that, you know, somebody said, Hey, this looks pretty safe. Let's take a look at it. Is it safe? Um, there's the, there's the label. Um, you know, I, I just love the labeling that's always very entertaining. So when you read through those ingredients, I mean, is there anything that really jumps out at you there? I see some vitamins, a little bit of caffeine, um, maybe some ingredients that I don't know what they are. I'd have to go look them up. And then I kind of read down and I'm like theophylline. It's a, you know, that's a prescription drug. Why does it have theophylline in it? You know, so you read some of this stuff and you're like, this is crazy. I don't want anybody taking this. That scored horribly. Um, not going to do it. Um, we actually, that's one of them we tested and it, it had a bunch of undisclosed ingredients in it. And then not a lot of the stuff that was on there. So, so not, not the greatest product out there. So what can you do as a provider, you know, like just being informed, um, and being able to, you know, have real conversations, you know, with your athletes, I think you need to ask directly every single one, you know, like, and just asking a medication history isn't enough. Like, like I really have to target it, ask, are you using pre-workout? Are you taking any, you know, performance enhancers? Do you drink energy drinks? You know, you have to ask the specific questions because that they don't consider those medications. So it doesn't come out in a medication history. Um, you know, I, I gave you kind of some, a lot of resources you can go to or send your athletes to so they can look stuff up. Cause like I said, the, there are hundreds of thousands of products on the market. You can't possibly begin to know them all. So you really do have to do a lot of looking things up. And then the other thing I encourage you to do is actually do take the time, um, to report adverse events. Cause it's the only way to get some semblance of control over this market, um, you know, so you can go to the FDA, um, website and report adverse events and it, they, you know, it can at least make a little bit of a nudge against this problem. Um, so here's my contact info. I mean, I'm happy to answer any more questions. Um, how are we doing for time? I do have a couple board review questions, but I wanted to, um, I kind of covered everything, um, that's on them in, in the talk. So I wanted to leave some time for questions. So I'll be quiet for a second. I'm going to stop my screen share so I can see your faces. Um, and happy to take any questions.
I think an initial question that I would have would be um, in your role as a toxicologist, what are some of the most common kind of adverse dietary supplement reactions that you see that might present to us either in our clinic or in the emergency room? And how can we use that to then for therefore counsel patients against use in the future? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, so obviously acute reactions, um, with like tachycardia and tachydysrhythmias, you know, are like the, are the immediate ones. And, and we talked about, you know, there have been cases of myocardial infarction and stroke or stroke mimics. Um, and so those are kind of what you see, you know, glaring you in the face. I took this thing and I'm having, you know, this reaction, but then the kind of more insidious are the, you know, uh, uh, liver toxicity where you're seeing elevations in their transaminases, or they might have altered lipid lipid profiles because of their, you know, deranged metabolics there. Um, and so sometimes that can be hard to unwind. Folks will show up with these, you know, laboratory abnormalities and making the connection back to the dietary supplement, especially when it's something that, that, according to the label would probably not cause problems. Um, and that's where this gets really hard because they'll bring their product in and they'll be like, I'm on this, a provider will read it and go, oh, there's nothing here that's liver toxic, but not recognizing it might have contaminants or adulterants. And so we really encourage, you know, anybody that's taking anything, if they have evidence of, of, you know, adverse events, particularly liver injury or renal injury, send that off for analysis because there might be, you know, a contaminant in there that is causing all that. You know, some of these supplements have heavy metals, some of them, you know, so, so you can see like weird neurologic things from heavy metals. Some of them, um, you know, like have a lot of um, plant-based substances that have very mixed ingredients. And so, you know, it will have effects. So those are the most common ones is, is, you know, unexplained elevations in creatinine or unexplained liver injury, um, are, are the most common. Great. And yeah, reporting it is the only way it becomes more known to everyone. So that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. And the content analysis, um, you know, we've, we've worked with a couple different labs. Um, we work a lot with Ole Miss. They have a great, um, they have a great library where they're able to, um, you know, kind of check everything against their library and identify the various substances. So, so um, definitely want to give them some credit. They've been a great partner of ours. Awesome. Another question is whether or not the NSF certification protects an athlete who would then test positive for a, on a drug test. It does not. They are not, you know, like they're ultimately responsible. Now, could they go back and sue NSF and recover some damages? Yeah, but ultimately they are responsible for what they put in their body. Um, and then I guess I get a lot of questions about apple cider vinegar, both as a supplement and just as the liquid form that you would buy over the counter is in terms of benefits um, to potential weight loss and that sort of aspect. So I wa was wondering if you wanted to or had any comments about the safety of that. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely pick the food product over the supplement um, for, for a lot of reasons. So first of all, you can kind of, you know, like if it, tastes like apple cider vinegar, it's apple cider vinegar, whereas opposed to something that's packaged in a more palatable way, they can put anything in there. Cause remember they're trying, you know, they're trying to hook you as a customer. Um, you know, so unless I know the person that was making it and what that lab looks like. So I, I would lean towards the food product, um, mix, mix data on whether or not it works and who it works in and how it works. Um, but, but yeah, it's out, you know, I mean, it's certainly out there. So I, I would lean towards a food product. The other benefit of the food product is it's probably an eighth of the cost of one of the pre-made supplements. So yeah. Yep. Another uh, question was what common vitamins and or supplements do you generally advise that athletes take or not take? Um, you know, that, that's such a, that's such a mixed bag question because they're, you know, it really depends on their dietary intake. Now, remember, you know, a supplement is intended to supplement the diet. So it, the whole intent of supplements is to look at where are those gaps or inadequacies in the diet and then fill it in. Um, you know, 
in in our military population. So I took care of the special operations community. It was pretty high stress, a lot of you know HPA axis dysfunction. We saw so much vitamin D deficiency um, in in guys that are outside every day. And so I have a lower threshold for looking for that in my athletes, just because I was very sensitized to it in in my population. Um, but but you can do a test, you know, like like I I I'm just. I'm kind of like, it's so easy to just do a test and see, um, but everything else I would, you know, I would want to base on what their nutritional intake is. And then, you know, trying to do some targeted balancing of that. If they're like, I absolutely don't eat this food ever. Um, you know, and then I'd think through, okay, what are their, you know, what are their deficiencies going to be? And, and honestly, you can test for all of it. So, if, so if I have an athlete, I'd be like, don't we want to hone in on this? You know, like, don't we, don't we want to do some precision things? You know, you work so hard to train, um, you know, I'd hate to, I'd hate to, you know, screw them up by not targeting, you know, what we're doing. Well, I don't know. If, those are all of the questions that have rolled in so far. I don't know if you wanted to do anything board exam wise. We have about five minutes until we typically try to wrap up. So I'll totally defer that to you. Um, so, you know, I'll just, I think I'll just share this of, you know, I went in, I went into the boards and I'm like, what could they possibly ask on dietary supplements? And some of the practice questions I saw out there, um, you know, talked about things that were kind of hot button topics. And so, you know, I mentioned creatine, you know, creatine went through this long history and in a first, it was like, everybody's like, oh my gosh, it's renal toxic. If you get a question on the boards that asks if, if creatine is, you know, renal toxic, it's, it's not in the majority of patients for people that have, you know, pre a predisposition to renal insult. It is the most common side effect of creatine can be like muscle cramping and then nausea, vomiting. And so if you see a, a board question on that, it's, it, it's trying to get at, Hey, it actually is pretty safe. Cause a lot of us thought it wasn't for a long time. Um, the other one that tends to come up is for osteoarthritis, the glucosamine, chondroitin, and, you know, the mix of it. And there was a New England Journal of Medicine article that basically showed um, in moderate to severe OA combination product can decrease pain, but in all comers, there wasn't a difference with placebo. So that, that one kind of tends to come up. The vitamin D comes up, but it comes up in like a bigger context, you know? Um, and so um, I think most of the vitamin D for, you know, anybody that's practiced medicine, you should be able to answer, you know, answer the question of like, you know, how do I, how do I monitor vitamin Ds? Um, I really never, haven't seen a lot. Those are the ones that tend to kind of be reappearing. Um, you know, products and then, and then understanding, you know, your, obviously your anabolics, um, you know, and, and performance enhancers. So what are your, you know, what would else, what do you consider performance enhancers, you know, so your stimulants, anabolics, peptides, those kind of things, um, of just having some lumping in your head of what are performance enhancers and what aren't, um, and, you know, you can just scroll through the list to kind of do that. But I think the WADA, categorization, like to read through that, at least those categories and how they define them um, is, you know, that just helped me a lot to kind of understand how they were being defined. And that, that, I mean, that's really, it's hard to like pick out what are they going to ask about dietary supplements? Cause it's, it's um, such a huge topic. So hopefully gave everybody a framework to use. Yeah, this was great. Um, I know I learned a lot and it was really helpful to rem remind myself of the things to look for um, on the back of the labels. And I think that that operation supplement safety scorecard is really helpful and an easy thing to give your patients because then they can help kind of put things in perspective as to whether or not it's a great, a good supplement to take or not. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, we, we can stick around if there's more questions, but other than that, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks so much. I really, really enjoyed talking. And like I said, anybody can reach out to me anytime. Happy to, happy to help.